All of them have designed one question that they've submitted to us in advance. They all know what their own question is, and they've set it up for them to hit it out of the park. All of their peers will have to respond to the same question on the fly. We will start to this round with Dr. Swinky from English, and we have a question from Dr. Swinky. Everybody, whether through natural disasters, infectious pandemics, global warfare, or zombie outbreaks, cultural representations of apocalypse involve violence. In these post-apocalyptic worlds, even people committed to nonviolence find themselves forced into inherently violent situations, whether literal or figurative. What is a violent aspect of your discipline, and how might your discipline's relation to violence help to rebuild civilization? One minute. I didn't realize I was going first. I didn't realize I was going first, but, okay. Uh, one, my partner, who also happens to be a colleague of mine in the English department, often says that education is an inherently violent act, right? It asks you to confront something that you are completely unfamiliar with, and if you do the learning, completely change your own perspective. So one of the things that literature does is that it forces us to come to the understanding that how we see the world is just the way that we see the world. That every single person in this room, even though we have the shared experience of what's going on right now, has their own interpretation of what is going on right now. And so what literature does, the study of literature asks us not to seek truth with a capital T, but to understand the multiple truths that are always at play and to ask and ask us to navigate those truths to try to find some kind of shared common ground. Most violence happens because of discomfort with difference, and that is something that's central to the, the study of literature and culture. Okay, I have here a text message from my cell phone, <laughs> which is comprised of elements necessary to operate your cell phone. And it says here on 10 7, gas emergency raise alert notification. Gas is coming from chemistry building area. Avoid central campus. Now, the inherent danger in that comes from the gas being deep. Also, has a being a natural affiliated in that text message with the chemistry field. So, yes, there is danger associated with understanding molecular structure uh, of how these molecules can interact, but also the skill set of, of, of learning chemistry and biochemistry can allow one to be able to critically think through methods and approaches and develop techniques to combat these types of dangers, which not only could affect Dixon Street and Maple Street, but our nation and our world. Oops. Well, violence, that's uh, what history is all about. I mean, uh, there's no censorship in history. And uh, I'll just be short because, you know, there's so much uh, time before. So, uh, yeah. But yes, learning, learning from those, you know, it's not just about the learning about those mistakes, but because those mistakes are human made. And so, the same way the literature, you know, creates that sort of community that Lopez was talking about, so does history, because at least our reading is not uh, grounded in fiction or fact here, you know, but we do uh, kind of look at the record and try to avoid that violence again. Thank you. I'd like to think my discipline provides solutions to the natural dangers that are in our world. The viruses that affect us, the bacterial diseases that get us, the genetic components of our own bodies that betray us. We have solutions from molecular biology through medications development to combat those dangers. They come with their own dangers but without them, we have no solutions to the dangers around us. Hey, 
have the first question. Our second question will come from Dr. Adams in chemistry. The question from Dr. Adams is, what contribution does your discipline make to an individual's physical and mental health or the health of the environment? Yes, One more time. What contribution does your discipline make to an individual's physical or mental health and the health of the environment? So, I want to back up. The two things that brought to my mind were uh, just some things that we as, as a society as we try to move forward as a populist. One of the main things, of course, is going to be mental health as well as our physical being. Um, it has been discussed tonight about how the, the biological significance of understanding how to uh, develop drugs from plants and, and uh, things of that nature are, are critical for our survival. However, in order to get a feasible amount of drugs, of a necessary drug from a plant, it takes a whole lot of plants. And you have to remember, we are coming out of the populace. We don't have no plants. <laughs> so how do we simply the and the nuances that organic, things like organic chemistry, although that is not a word that brings pleasant thoughts in people's minds. It is a necessary is a necessary aspect of understanding chemistry and life, life processes uh, in order to be able to design in the laboratory molecules that can be used to deliver drugs through nanotechnology and other fast paced, fast changing technological advances in our society. I'll ask the panel, is passing allowed? physical and mental health or the health of the environment. Okay, so it's, uh, it's post-apocalypse here, and as you said, the, the resources are not there. Uh, sure, we can have the technical abilities to do that, but we also need some organization. And to organize uh, society, we need the kind of uh, leadership that will uh, coordinate the people to uh, get to that point. So yes, I will want to have that amount of biology, which I have also studied as a historian of science, and then I will have, you know, the uh, leadership necessary and then I will uh, provide that kind of sense of organization that comes from uh, uh, knowing the, the, uh, uh, the learning skills that come from, uh, from research, the best research you could possibly do is through uh, uh, the uh, uh, records that we have left. Without those records, you cannot make that scientific leap into what is coming next. So those records will have, will have, you know, whatever is left, will have to uh, uh, be analyzed as well. Thank you. Please understand that the nature of the apocalypse was not explained before we took the stage. If there are no plants, as I explained to my cell biology class this morning, you can kiss it goodbye. We won't be eating anything. So, let's move on from there and assume there are. <laughs> and because of my discipline's understanding of what our bodies need for our brains to operate, for our muscles to operate, and what organisms need to have survived in order to interact with each other, I believe that biological sciences brings the only solution to bringing the nutrition to our cells, our brains, and harmony to the environment. Last up. Oscar Wilde in The Picture of Dorian Gray uh, writes that art has, uh, art annihilates the desire to act. And it's not a nihilistic view of the world or a pessimistic view of the world. It's a view that in this world we have, we need outlets to keep our sanity. And art, literature, culture, um, although we need, we need the sustenance and the nutrients um, to, to nurture our bodies, 
uh, our, our minds and our mental health um, and, and our ability to empathize and sympathize and build community with others relies heavily on our ability to create new things, to be artistic, to be original, to be unique, and also to find those points of connection with other, other individuals. That's what nourishes the mind. So I'm sure that having an, an English professor or someone who is well-versed at the very least in literature will be useful in that regard to balance, right, just the, the physical health that we also need uh, to survive. All right, we'll pass the mic over to Dr. Broji with history. Our question from history tonight is as follows. History shows that in an apocalyptic situation, Humans may find solidarity, but they more often become less human. There will be a struggle for scarce resources, there will be factions forming, conflict, chaos leading into further destruction. How does your discipline prepare students to maintain peace and cooperation in an apocalyptic situation? Okay, well, uh, with the formation of conflict uh, and factions, there will be leaders and some of them will be a little hard-handed, heavy-handed, and uh, a little dictatorial. So the first thing I will try to uh, tell them, and you as historians uh, will, will, will have to tell them, is uh, have, have, have a, some booze, have a cigar, and uh, uh, invite them to be at least a benevolent uh, dictator. It will show, uh, it will be able to show that the emperor has no clothes. And going back to that Sidney Harris quote, uh, the skills of history uh, research will allow you to see the risk in this, in this well-concealed disguise, show the resemblance that, uh, with the mistakes and the lies about the past. Our friend Adolf here uh, was famous for saying, if you tell uh, a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. History is without question the best antidote we have to our delusions of omnipotence, uh, and omniscience, self-knowledge. From history is the indispensable prelude to self-control for the nation as well as for the individual. Thank you. Chaos is something that can form when people have the energy for chaos. If you don't have food, if you don't have water, if you don't have what you need to live, you form peaceful coalitions to find those resources that are critical to go on to the next day. I believe my discipline provides the knowledge base necessary to find those resources to sustain ourselves and to, and to establish a sustainable system for the future. And so I believe it's that nature that will avoid and disrupt chaos. We're going to hear a question one more time upon request. History shows that in an apocalyptic situation, humans may find solidarity, but they more often become less human. There will be a struggle for scarce resources, there will be factions forming, conflict, chaos leading into further destruction. How does your discipline prepare students to maintain peace and cooperation in an apocalyptic situation? Again, all of those uh, things that create divides and separation are the biggest uh, things that undermine civilization as a whole. Uh, if any of you are familiar with any zombie films, or specifically if we're thinking about The Walking Dead, uh, there's always strength in numbers, right? Me, don't go off by yourself into the middle of the zombie apocalypse because you're going to die. That's just how it works. Uh, so the thing that we absolutely need is a discipline or people who understand that there are strength in numbers and that conflict resolution and finding our points of shared interest are, is absolutely key to survival. And again, the, the way that we do that the way that we find common ground is through storytelling, through shared narratives that everyone can latch onto and take what they need from those narratives in order to move forward. Uh, notice that a lot of us keep coming back to examples from literature or from shows or 
even from his, his history, that we're still always involved in telling stories because that's what brings it alive and that's what makes people connect. So any scientific understanding of anything as well needs you need an example, a story to help you remember it. One of the one of the things that I think makes uh, the study of, of, of natural sciences such as chemistry and biochemistry um, the, 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 the technical nuances required to develop a basic skill set, so general skill set requires a, a development of critical thought from a different point of view. Uh, I think that a, a basic knowledge base, a basic understanding of how to critically think through circumstances, particularly negative circumstances, even if they don't have to do with atoms and molecules and, and something like physiological, chemical, or biochemical processes that equip us as people and as a society to be able to work through chaotic environments and chaotic situations to come through these solutions and move forward. Our next question comes from Dr. Henry with biology. Biology's question tonight is, those attempting to rebuild civilization will need to be able to find, create, or exploit a number of resources. What resources will the new society need in order to survive, and how does your discipline prepare us to find, create, or exploit those resources? First of all, understand that my discipline, which is the study of life, but it's the chemistry and the physical nature of life gives me probably one of the broadest backgrounds at the table. It also gives me an understanding of what we need to find, grow, sustainably create over and over, which is a food source. We don't know with this apocalypse whether or not plants are gone, animals are gone, but the fact that we have a full understanding from microorganisms all the way through hairy animals like ourselves gives us the capability, the understanding of what it is we need to find, when we need to find it, and what's critical. So I believe that puts us in a best position to create resources that are not only immediate, but to create sustainable resource solutions for the upcoming future, whatever that may be. And I still hold, if we have no plants, it doesn't matter. resource that we have moving forward in a post-apocalyptic world are ourselves, are the other people who also uh, share the space and whatever it is that is left over, be they plant, hopefully we got plants. That's what I'm telling you. But you know, I'm not a scientist, but I know how to garden. So... <laughs> for all of us to understand that we need all of these disciplines. We need all of the people, hopefully, that survive have basic skill sets, um, and hopefully they all got a nice broad-based liberal arts education so they know how to plant things, right? Um, and they know how to boil their water, filter it. Um, I don't know, other, other luxuries I think we can, we can maybe do without for a while. Sometimes uh, the best thing is you know, as many of the romantic poets knew, like sometimes you need to leave the modern world behind and return to nature to really find out who you are and what you value. So, in that sense, I think, again, the biggest resource we have is ourselves and knowing that we're all connected and finding ways to navigate that new world uh, together. In order to provide uh, the sustainability necessary to rebuild our, our post-apocalyptic society, um, it, is, it is imperative that we, we maintain some sort of general understanding of how molecules impact our society. In order for our plants to be, be grow and continue to grow and be sustainable, they have to be protected against pesticides the environmental calamities. An understanding of molecular structure that allows us to develop uh, these types of, of uh, compounds that, that can help keep plants growing. Uh, parasites, 
of the microorganisms that are also can be beneficial and can also can be detrimental. And again, by understanding how to manipulate molecules at a fundamental level can give us an insight on how to best approach um, aiding in the sustainability of our society as we move forward. So uh, we had uh, two skill sets here uh, that uh, specialize in how to master the resources and two uh, sets of skills that uh, will help us master the uh, human nature that uh, should lead us to those resources. So yes, it, it, uh, I agree with all this, that in the end, it is about how we uh, organize this uh, research towards those resources. I come from a country that has gone through a lot of periods of starvation and poor resources in Italy. And uh, we have a saying in my country that it's, uh, it's the art of managing and how many times we have managed. And frankly, we are doing pretty well learning from those lessons because of how, as a society, and how from our long, long history, we have learned how to uh, reorganize and rebuild from scratch again. So when we have very little to uh, resort to, uh, and uh, we don't even have the technical tools to uh, uh, kind of uh, operate those, uh, those, uh, those chemical compounds, perhaps you know, the, the, the necessary human uh, condition uh, that uh, will help us understand that you can do little, uh, you can do a lot with little. Uh, maybe that's, that's what we can learn from us uh, as humans. All right, that has concluded the questions we have from the faculty who are on the stage. However, what some of you may not know is that we were supposed to have a fifth uh, member with us here tonight representing the Department of Theater. The performing arts can conquer a lot of things. Bronchitis is not one of them. In the spirit of the fine arts, we want to include that question for the panel because they all would have had to answer it. So a question in the spirit of the fine arts and whoever wants to take this first can take this first. How does a healthy understanding of and appreciation for the performing arts make students or practitioners in your field better at what they do? <laughs> we do what we do because other people believe in what we can do, provide us the resources with what we can do, because we're good enough at performing and convincing to get them to give us the money and the necessary equipment to do what we do. Performing arts? Are you kidding? Everything we do is performance. We're selling. We're trying to tell you how it's going to help you so that we can do what we think is important for you. It's performance and it's a sales job. But in the end, hopefully it does help. <laughs> is inherently a perform it's also it's violent and it's also inherently performative. Uh, we are all performing for you on stage today in order to get a point across. Uh, if I go back to my original example of Frankenstein, most of you have probably encountered Frankenstein. How? In a movie, right? And Stage adaptations of Frankenstein were actually the most crucial in terms of making that narrative uh, widely accessible to a broad audience, much more than the book. So absolutely, uh, performance is key to uh, keeping something alive, adaptation. Adaptation in and of itself is inherently performative in nature because it's, it, it Asks, or it requires an, an adaptation and an understanding of its, its surroundings and finding the way to uh, best express itself in those, in those in, in environments, in those new environments and for new audiences. So uh, the fine arts and performance is absolutely key in terms of both keeping our stories alive, especially if we don't have you know, lots of books to read. We'll, we'll all be performing these stories around a campfire at night. Um, and also because in terms of learning anything, in order for it to truly stick, it needs to be performative um, and, and adapt to its audience. To see a 
calcium ion traverse or move through the atomic arrangements that is a double helix, a helical structure of atoms put together so that this ion can go from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. And to be able to understand how these atomic arrangements and be able to actually visualize them, that's hard. To see how the, 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 to be able to visualize through our understanding of the fundamental nature of atoms and ions and how they interact with each other. That we can't see with our naked eye, but we can visualize using other approaches uh, such as computers and other, uh, other visualization parameters allow us to use chemistry as a source of art. I think that uh, visualizing something is one of the key one of the most fundamental uh, keys to actually strengthen one's ability to learn, actually be able to see it. So to use what we learn from techniques at the atomic level, but to be able to apply them to a visualization program provides an education and it also provides a level of artistic interpretation. History is art. Oh, history as, as performance. It happens, it happens all the time. Uh, whenever I, I, I feel that I'm, I'm boring the pants off of my students, uh, I show them history through fiction, the historical movies. And if I want to talk about nuclear war, I show them uh, Dr. Strangelove. Like, and it's, it's exciting as uh, Frankenstein to see how the apocalypse may happen. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, to, to, to nurture that human nature, yes, we need sometimes to, to uh, kind of uh, embellish history a little bit. I will not have a screen, I will not have a projector, at least, and I will not have books probably, but the, problem, the point is exactly this, that you know, it will stay in here, it will not be forgotten, so we will just navigate it that way, and uh, at, in front of you, at, re-at, sometimes in costumes, perhaps, okay?